I suppose all of us, if not some or most of us, have a favorite television show. Some, it may go all the way back to the heyday of early television, the I Love Lucy and the Honeymooners. Others might be fond of the science fiction series of the 60s, Lost in Space and Star Trek. Some might be fond of the detective series of the 70s, Hawaii Five-0, not the current one, the old one with Jack Lord, Cannon, or Columbo. Some might like the nighttime soap operas of the 80s, Dallas and Dynasty and Falcon Crest. As for me, everything, and I do mean everything, one way or another, comes down to an episode of Frasier. <laughs> and in one of the early episodes, Frasier is waiting for a very hot date. He's going to entertain her at his home. He has a nice dinner he's going to cook. He's waiting for her arrival. She is a supermodel. And when she arrives, she has her daughter in tow and says, Frazier, I have a last-minute photo shoot. It'll only take an hour, but if you can watch my daughter for an hour, I'd really appreciate it. So Frazier, of course, not wanting to let her down, agrees to look after her daughter. And during that time with her, he has a conversation with the daughter in which she informs him of her relationship with her mother, how her mother will often leave her alone at home as she goes on dates with her two boyfriends, how one time she left her in the car while she went and had her shoulder tattooed, and telling Fraser story after story of this terrible relationship that they have. So by the time her mother comes back and then sends her off with the driver to be babysat by her grandmother, Fraser suddenly is no longer interested in having a date with this woman, and he confronts her with what her daughter said about her, and basically said, it's not going to work, I'm not interested. And then she does something that completely caught Fraser off guard and was the last thing he expected her to do. She stood up for herself. The names of those two boyfriends my daughter told you about are the names of our two hamsters. As for the tattoo on my shoulder, do you see anything on my shoulder there? Fraser admitted no, but then again his eyes were beginning to tear up. She says, it didn't occur to you that she's 12 years old, wanted to stay home alone and was angry because I wouldn't let her, and that she was angry and maybe lied? And by the way, I only have one kidney. Guess who has the other one? Needless to say, Fraser didn't get his date that night. But he was so shocked and, kept and caught completely off guard by someone who stood up for herself to his own criticism. We have something like that in today's Gospel. A very delightful story found only in the Gospel of Luke of the little man who climbed the tree, Zacchaeus, the chief tax collector. And when Jesus is received into his home, he is highly criticized because Zacchaeus is a sinner. And Zacchaeus stands up for himself, defends himself. An older translation says, Zacchaeus stood his ground and said, Behold, Lord, I give half my belongings to the poor, and if I have defrauded anybody, I will, I pay it back fourfold. The current translation, which is probably a little more accurate, puts it in the future tense. But either way, he stands up for himself and will not allow his critics to use him as a means of criticizing Jesus. And in defending himself, he invariably defends Christ. We are called to do the same, and Zacchaeus is a very strong example of defending oneself, standing up for oneself, and standing up for the faith. And every now and again, we are called to do it, especially in times that our country sees right now, where we see some hostility toward Christianity and Catholicism. And that's especially the case during a, a very politically charged season, season of an election. Of course, the church isn't the only one that finds themselves the target of criticism during a politically charged season. It seems every time there's an election, someone is out there criticizing, for example, our law enforcement officers. But they also tend to criticize people of a religious faith. And in all contexts, we are called to defend that faith, to stand up for ourselves. We may not get a positive reaction. I think Zacchaeus probably didn't get too positive a reaction to those who were criticizing him, but he certainly got a positive response from Jesus, who said, this man is a true son of Abraham. 
and salvation has come to his house. In times such as these, there are multiple reactions to how people defend their faith. Some have a very positive reaction from people because it enriches them, makes them feel a certain pride and happiness of learning about their faith and the impact that it has in our society. Others, perhaps in this season, might love how someone defends their faith because they're politically minded and it agrees with a particular political agenda they might have. They completely miss the point, but they see it as an affirmation of their political agenda. By the same token, some who don't see it as an affirmation of that agenda might not like it, again, completely missing the point of defending the faith, but only seeing it through the lens of politics. And then there are others I have often heard who say, well, many people come from many different circumstances, and we have to be sensitive to the multiple circumstances from which people are coming forth to hear a speech or a homily, you name it. And when you think about that, it really doesn't make too much sense because if a speaker, be it a politician, a teacher, or a preacher, has to cater to every single possible scenario of every single particular circumstance of every single individual who might be hearing the message, we'd smooth our message so much that the message is now flat, if there's a message at all. It's enough for one to simply hear a message and say, well, it doesn't really apply to me, thank God. But if one hears it and it does apply to them, maybe in a very particular, uncomfortable way, then I always like to encourage people to be aware and not to write off the many ways in which God can speak to us, even personally, in the most important act of worship we have here in the Eucharist. I would encourage people in that case, don't come marching up to the speaker and take issue with what they said because they didn't like it, but give it a couple of days, internalize it, meditate upon it and reflect upon how God may be speaking to you in that message, even one that might be uncomfortable, because God challenges us in so many different ways and can possibly do so, heaven forbid, in the context of the Mass. As for the other group, it is unfortunate and a reality in our church and in the Christian community that there are those who profess a Christian faith who will nonetheless actively side with people who are openly critical of the church, be they politicians, teachers, family members, and so on. And when a person does that, a Christian or a Catholic, actively sides with a, someone who's critical of the church, are we really surprised that they would respond negatively to someone who defends the church? But we have all sorts of reactions that people would have of any of us when we respond in defense of the church the way Zacchaeus does in defending himself and defending Christ's, and Christ's accepting of his invitation. But how do we do such things? Well, first of all, we need to know what is being said and how they say such things about the church. And there are many, many different things. But among my personal favorites, and as you all know, history is a favorite subject of mine, I find a great deal of experience when people have come to me with issues regarding the church. They always tend to bring up the same two issues. I'll even throw in a third as well. But the same two issues are the Crusades and the Inquisition. You've heard that. What about those Crusades? What about the Inquisition? And it shows a great deal of ignorance that we all have, including the critic of what the Crusades and the Inquisition were all about. I won't get too much into it. That's a whole different talk. But you ask, what are the Crusades? Someone last week, not critically, did happen to ask me. They said, well, they heard that the Crusades introduced Christianity to the Middle East. And I reminded them where Christianity actually developed. <laughs> Was in the Middle East, where it flourished as a Christian territory for 600 years before it was taken and conquered, some would say stolen, by the forces of the Islamic Jihad, which for the next 600 years had an onslaught in Europe, Spain, France, along the coastal regions, the islands of the Mediterranean, for over 500 years before Europe finally decided to take the fight to the enemy and perhaps liberate once Christian territory which they did very successfully for 200 years, the Crusader Kingdoms. So there's a little bit more about the Crusades than perhaps we know and even our critics know. As for the Inquisition, I always like to ask them what they think the Inquisition was, and more often than not they mean the Spanish Inquisition, which is its own monster and is an example of what happens to church institutions when they're corrupted by politics. Just ask Charles V and Ferdinand and Isabella 
the kings and queens of Spain and the Holy Roman Empire at the time. But what was the Inquisition? What was the period out of which it emerged? The Middle Ages, the medieval times, in which monarchs, kings and lords and noblemen exercised absolute power over life and death. They could have anyone arrested, imprisoned, and even executed for any reason not the least of which was if they wanted to get rid of a particular bishop that they didn't like, or a priest or a religious teacher who wasn't that advantageous to them politically, they would simply accuse them of heresy, have them arrested, and perhaps executed. And there's where the church said, not so fast. In matters of theology, the church will come in, examine the teachings, give the accused a chance to defend themselves, and if they are guilty of error, a chance to recant, which most of them did. And in fact, the Inquisition saved more alleged heretics than, alas, it burned at the stake or executed. But what did we see happen as a result of the Inquisition? At a time of absolute power of the monarchs over life and death, the Inquisition introduced a very cherished value, legal value, which we call due process of law examination of evidence, rights of the accused. Wasn't a perfect system, what system ever is, but have we ever asked ourselves why today in our courts, judges wear black robes? Or in Europe, higher judges wear purple and red? These are ecclesiastical colors that are directly descended from the Inquisition. I said I'd add one more. Whenever I've gotten into a disputation with someone who likes to criticize the church, they always like to save as what I call their nuclear option. What about those scandals? Which, of course, we all remember from 15 years ago. Folks, whenever anyone brings up the scandals, I know I have won that argument. Because there's nowhere else they think they can go, and they think there's no way you can defend the church on that. Which, by the way, I don't try to. There is no defense for what happened, the terrible things that happened, and the incompetent manner in which they were handled. I talk about what the church has done since then, and how the church has so thoroughly addressed this issue that it is now the first human institution in history to aggressively address this issue within its own ranks. And we've seen, even right here at St. Bruno's, the Veritas programs we've encouraged our staff and our volunteers to engage in, the fingerprinting, the background checks, even projects that Father Dave would like to start here in the parish to further enhance the security of our students, faculty, and staff of our school and CCD. And so thoroughly has the church addressed this, at least in the Archdiocese of LA, that now there are organizations that work with children that are actually consulting the Catholic Church on how better to protect children. All this as a result of how the church responded to the terrible scandals. So when a person wants to bring those up, I am more than happy to oblige. But these are ways in which we can defend our church, stand up for ourselves, stand up for our faith. And how do we do that? I answer in just one simple word. Learn our faith. Learn about our church's teaching. Learn about our church's history. Read. Read widely. Read wisely. And don't allow our critics to use us or their ignorance, which is the breeding ground of prejudice, as their means of attacking our church and our Savior. A couple of weeks ago, I offered a homily in which I recommended two books that talk about the church's impact in history. One is entitled, How the Church Built Western Civilization. Another one by an author named Rodney Stark is called, How the West Won, about how the Western civilizations, including the church, built modernity. Another book, also by Rodney Stark, his most recent book, just published a few months ago, is a book entitled Bearing False Witness, Debunking Centuries of Anti-Catholic History. Among other issues and other anti-Catholic myths of history, two chapters cover the Inquisition and the Crusades. 
as does a chapter in the book How the West Won. But why deal with just a chapter? Rodney Stark has another book called God's Battalions, The Case for the Crusades. When I read this one, I couldn't put it down. It's quite a thrilling read, really putting the Crusades in the context of history and the defense of Christendom against the onslaught of, jih of jihad. But that's just history. There's teachings of the church. There's the morality of the church, which we can continue to learn and grow so that we could have the tools for occasions such as Zacchaeus saw in today's gospel, so that we, in the midst of those who would otherwise use us to criticize the church or its history, we can, like Zacchaeus, stand our ground, stand before them, stand up for ourselves, stand up for our faith, stand up for our church, and in that, stand up for our Savior. And perhaps we too will hear the words of Jesus, salvation has come to your house because you know what it means to be a child of Abraham.